Welcome to or welcome back to Wrong Sports. Back with you with another list. It's been a while since I've done the top 10 list before I did a top 10 list of the best division three football coaches, which is a division in the NCAA that I think don't get enough love. I'm going to be doing more lists about division three sports in the future. But this list is going to be a little different because I'm not going to be in the NCAA for this one. I'm going to be in the NAIA. And if you don't know about the NAIA, it stands for the National Association of Intercollegiate Athletics, and it consists of 250 schools from all over North America. Yes, there are schools actually in Canada and in the Virgin Islands, there is a school as well. And these schools vary in enrollment as there are some schools with as little as 700 students to a few with an enrollment over 4,000. There's not gonna be many with like 10,000 or 50,000 like the NCAA. These schools also give out scholarships, which makes it different as the NCAA has different divisions of given scholarships. But I'm not gonna be going over that in this list because in this first list, and hopefully there will be more on the NAIA, I'm gonna try and cover the top 10 best coaches from the NAIA football. But before I get into this list, make sure as always you subscribe to the channel below. And if you haven't already, please ring the bell so you can get updates on brand new videos that I will be dropping in the future. If you have not helped out the channel, you can do that again on my Patreon. The link is in the description below, or you can check out my podcast. A link is in the description below. I have exclusive podcasts there, like I have an exclusive podcast about the discontinued story of the Hofstra football team. So you can check that out. And before I start the list, I want to do a little disclaimer because I'm putting coaches on this list that mostly coached at the NAIA level. So I won't have coaches like John Gallardi or Roger Herring, since they coach teams that played in both the NAIA and Division III NCAA levels. But those guys won't be on this list as they were on my best coaches of Division III football, so just a heads up so you don't get mad at me as to why those two guys and some other guys aren't on this list. But starting off this list, I'm going to start it a little different because I couldn't figure out who I wanted to have in this top 10. So I basically have like a top 11. I have two guys tied for the top 10. And these two coaches have a few things in common. One is that they both have over 200 wins. They have also coached only one team. And they started coaching in the same year. And they don't have national titles. And I mentioned that final thing because every other coach on this list will have a national title or two. But the two coaches tied for the top 10. First is Ted Kessinger, who coached at Bethany College in Kansas from 1976 to 2003. This school has under 1,000 students, but it has a great name as they're called the Fighting Swedes. And when Kessinger coached there, he posted a record of 219, 57, and 1. He guided them to the NAIA playoffs 10 times and achieved a top 25 ranking 20 times. I also wanted to put him on this list because Bethany teams never posted a losing season while he was there for the over 25 years of him coaching. And along with him, the other top 10 coach is Hank Bishu. He coached at Dickinson College in North Dakota starting again in 1976, but he coached an extra decade as he coached until 2013. And Dickinson College has just barely 1,000 students. It's located in southwestern North Dakota, which is a place that not a lot of people live in or tend to visit, which shows just how great of a job Bishu did at this school. He has 17 conference titles. He went to the NAIA playoffs 14 times. They went as far as the semifinals as well, which was a game further than Kessinger went. But Bishu would have four losing seasons, three in his final years at the school. So I don't really want to punish him too much, but this guy had basically 30 plus years of non-losing seasons at this school. And I couldn't really choose which guy was better and who should be at number 10, which was why I'm going to put both of them there. They both pretty much had the same situation as they they were at smaller schools that they coached in in the 1970s and 1980s when the NAIA playoff tournament was pretty small so it was harder for these smaller schools to make it into the tournament even with winning records or winning their conference so that's why these guys probably could have made it to more playoffs if they would have coached at bigger schools or later in time. But after those two guys tied at top 10, we're going to get into number 9, which only has one guy, which is Steve Ryan. This guy has gained a lot of acclaim lately and notice because he has won three national titles in the last five years. But Steve Ryan should actually be given more praise for what he has done at Morningside University out of Sioux City, Iowa. 
Ryan was a graduate of Wheaton College and their football team in 1989. He played on their football team for three years, and after school, he wouldn't get into coaching immediately, but would eventually get on the staff at Ottawa College in Kansas, and then he would get his first head coaching job at Morningside University, which had just ended their football team after the 2000 season. The school voted to bring it back, and Ryan took the job, having to do a lot of work, as the team averaged two wins a season through the 1990s, with a few winless seasons sprinkled in. When he got there, he would win eight games in his first two years, which was the worst stretch of his time at the school, because after that, he would never win less than eight games a year. He won his first conference title in 2005 and got the team to the NAIA semifinals. He would continue to win nine games a year for the rest of the 2000s and got his team to the quarterfinals of the playoffs. But the 2010s would be his best decade so far, as starting in 2011, his team would win the conference every year and only lost three conference games over the last 12 seasons. Incredible. He got the team to the NAIA championship game for the first time in 2012, but they lost. And then to end the 2010s, he got his team to be on the national radar as they went undefeated in 18 and 19, winning his first two national football titles. He then would win his third in 2021, and at the end of 2022, Ryan and Morningside are going through an amazing run as they went 64 and 2 from 2018 to 2022. And here's another tidbit this team hasn't lost a conference game since 2014. Ryan could be a little higher on my list if I waited a few more years, because at the clip this guy is going, he could win five more national titles before the 2020s is up. Coming in at number eight is our first coach from Ohio, Dick Strom. And he had a different start to his career than others on this list. That's because he started at the high school level for about a decade. Then he was an assistant at the Division I level at Toledo from 1970 to 72, when Toledo was on a 36-game winning streak. After that, he would go to Kansas State, which was going through the opposite of a winning streak. And then that would lead him back to Ohio, as in 1975, he was hired by the University of Finley to be their head coach. And Finley was a pretty good program before he got there, as they had two NAIA playoff appearances in the 1960s, but they weren't a consistent winner. As soon as Dick Strom started, though, he would consistently win and consistently get them to the playoffs. He would start with a losing record, which was only one of two during his time there, and then he would follow that up with four straight conference titles and two berths in the NAIA title game in 1978 and 79, with him winning the Division II version of the NAIA title in 1979. He would have another stretch of four straight conference titles from 1982 to 85 until the team went independent. And at the independent level, they would play some NCAA Division III teams along with the top NAIA teams, and they were still winning as they scored another NAIA Division II title in 1992 before they would join the Mid-States Football Association in 1994. And when they got into that new conference, they would win another NAIA Division II title in 1995, and then would win the first NAIA title in 1997. That was when both divisions would merge, and as Finley would go 14-0 that season too. And that was shockingly Strom's only undefeated season while he was there. Strom would retire after the 1998 season as he went 183, 64-5, having four national titles, and he has the acclaim of winning two types of NAIA national titles. And now we're going to go out west for number seven as we have Ad Rutschman. And this guy is a Pacific Northwest legend. And something he has in common with other coaches on this list is that he never had a losing season. Rutschman started as a high school coach just outside of Portland, Oregon in the 1950s. He then coached high school football and baseball for about 13 years until Linfield College in Oregon hired him for not only football, but for baseball too. He would start winning and never stopped, as again, he never had a losing season, and he only lost four games in a season two times over his 24 years at the school. But even though he was always winning, he had trouble of getting to a national title. Now, I mentioned in the previous guy how the NAIA had two divisions at this point, Division I and Division II, and well, only eight teams got in each tournament. So even if you won your conference, you weren't always invited. 
and Linfield was in Division Two at this point, and they weren't really invited too much. Especially in the 1970s, it would change a lot in the 1980s as they were invited to the playoffs more, and they would get to the finals more, and they would start to win the national title more as they won it three times in 1982, 84, and 86. His best win of those three was in 1984, when Linfield fell behind by 22 points as late as the third quarter, but they managed to score five touchdowns in less than one quarter to win the national title game. On top of his three NAIA national titles, he also won the Northwest Conference 15 times, and they were never below second in the conference through his 24 years at the school. He would retire in 1991 with a 183-48-3 record, and Rutschman is brought up nowadays because his grandson, Adley, is on the Baltimore Orioles and is one of the best young players in Major League Baseball. And coming in at number six, this guy probably could have been in the top five, but I, I just I couldn't put him in over some of the other guys I have in my top five. But the amount of winning that this guy has done is pretty spectacular, considering how small the school was that he coached at. His name is Joe Fusco, is a Western Pennsylvania guy who went to Westminster College just outside of Pittsburgh in the late 1950s. He would then immediately get into coaching at the high school level around the Pittsburgh area through the 1960s until he took an assistant job at his alma mater under another legendary coach that this school had in Harold Burry. Now, I say Burry is a legend because this guy won an NAIA national title in 1970, and he would win just about 75% of his games. It wouldn't be too long until he was a head coach of his alma mater in 1972 and would coach them for the next 18 years. The school was one of the smallest schools, and still is, in the NAIA, as they have just around 1,200 students. Along with that, the school was at the NAIA independent level, which means that they played teams that were small, like them, but they also could play teams that were much bigger than them. It didn't matter though, as they would be 27-5-1 through his first four seasons, and then broke through to win the NAIA Division II title in 1976. He then followed it up with an undefeated 1977 season and another national title. The 1980s would be his best as Fusco, and Westminster would make it to the NAIA tournament seven more times, and they capped off the decade with two straight undefeated seasons, winning national titles. Fusco would retire from coaching after the 1990 season, where again they made it to the national title game but lost, which would have given him three in a row, and he would end his career with a 153 34 and 3 record, as well as the best winning percentage of any coach on this list, as he won 81% of his games. This might be considered more spectacular, considering the school was so small, and also they didn't play in a conference, which made it a lot harder to get into the national tournament. And now we are in the top five with a guy who has had success at a multiple amount of schools, and that's why he's in the top five of my list. His name is Kevin Donnelly. Donnelly played fullback and linebacker at Anderson College in Indiana, graduating in 1973. He quickly moved into coaching as he was named the offensive coordinator at the school just after he graduated, yes. And then he became the head coach at his alma mater just three years later at the age of 26. He was the youngest coach in the country at the time. And even though he was young, he showed he was wise beyond his years as he went 28 and nine over his first four years of coaching. And he has the highest winning percentage at his school all before the age of 30. He would then move to Georgetown College in Kentucky in 1982 and struggled to keep his winning ways, but would eventually hit his stride in 1987 when Georgetown moved to the Mid-South Conference. From 1987 to 1992, Donnelly and Georgetown would win their conference every year but one and also made it to the NEIA tournament but lose it in the first round. 1991 would be when he finally broke through for his first NEIA title. And his team was awesome this year as they averaged 53 points per game or scored 744 total points which was the most for a team in a while in all of college football. After that epic year, Donnelly would move out of the NAIA level to the NCAA Division II level, as he would coach the California University of Pennsylvania starting in 1993, and he was pretty bad there. 
as he only averaged three wins a year and would quickly move back to the NAIA level. His move back was to a school that was just starting their football program in the University of St. Francis. He started the football program in 1998 and then took them to the NAIA tournament the very next year. Donnelly would lead the team to the NAIA tournament for the next 10 years in a row, and they even went on a stretch where they went to the NAIA championship game three years in a row, unfortunately not winning any of them. Donnelly and St. Francis would finally get their NAIA championship as in 2016 and then a repeat in 2017 where they won 14-0 in both years. He is still coaching at St. Francis as of 2022 and his NAIA record is 331, 116, and 1. But after coaching for 40 plus years, who knows how much more coaching he will do. Number four is a coach that many people told me should have been on my list of best division three coaches that I did a little while ago. And yes, I agree he can be on this list as number four is going to be Frosty Westering. But I didn't want to put Westering on my list of division three coaches because he coached most of his career at the NAIA level and put Pacific Lutheran College on the map. Westering is originally from Iowa and fought in World War II as a Marine before he went off to Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa, and he would also play football for the Drake University team that played in the 1946 Raisin Bowl. He would go back into the military after that and eventually come back to the States to finish his college and get right into coaching. He started coaching in 1952 as a high school coach in Iowa and did that for the next 10 years when he got his first head coaching college job at Parsons College in Iowa. He would immediately win there as they went 9-0 and won the conference in his first year. He then moved to Lee College in Minnesota in 1966 and coached there until 1971. After that though, Westering went west, all the way west, to Washington State to take the job at Pacific Lutheran University in Parkland, Washington. The school did have a good reputation before he got there, but once he started in 1972, Westering made them even better. He did this by never having a losing season for 31 years. He won 305 games, losing 95, and he also had seven ties, putting him top 10 in wins all time. But what made him even better than most is that he didn't have a certain stretch that was better than any other time. He would start by winning a conference title in his second year, and by his ninth season, he was a national champion. He would win two more national titles in 1987 and 1993, so this guy spread him around. He would also coach Pacific Lutheran as they transitioned from the NEIA level to the Division III level, and he won a national title at the Division III level as well in 1999. Most of the reason why he wasn't on my Division III coaches list was because he spent the better part of his career at the NAIA level. But again, you could have put this guy on both lists just because of the amount of winning and the consistent winning that Westering did. Coming in at number three, you might say that this next coach did a lot of his winning all in one decade. But at number three is Mike Van Deest, who still managed to win 203 games in less than 20 seasons at Carroll College in Helena, Montana. Van Deest went to school at Wyoming in the mid-1970s, and then he jumped into coaching shortly after, working at Wyoming and then Montana until 1985. He got a bigger job as he would be an assistant at Northwestern from 1987 to 1990, before heading back to his alma mater in the 1990s. He would finally get his first head coaching job at Small Carroll College in 1999. And Carroll College wasn't unknown by college football fans, as they had given the legend John Gallardi his first head coaching job in 1949, where he won three conference titles. And then they would get even more attention because they won the Frontier Conference 14 times through the 1970s and 80s under Bob Petrino. Yes, the father of Bobby Petrino. So when Mike Van Deest got the Carroll job, he knew the winning tradition, and he knew he could get Carroll to being even better bigger as he would win the Frontier Conference for the first time in his second year of the year 2000. Then he would win his first NAIA national title in his fourth year of 2002. And Carroll under Mike Van Deest would create a dynasty starting in that year 
as they won the NAIA national title six times, all before the year of 2000, including four seasons where his team went undefeated at either 14-0 or 15-0, and they had winning streaks of 20-plus twice during that time. The peak of Carroll College under Mike Van Deest ended in 2014 as he struggled as the team had four straight losing records from 2015 to 18 and he retired after that season with 203 wins, 54 losses. And if you don't count those final four years, Mike Van Deest had a 186 and 22 record over his first 15 years with a winning percentage that really no coach can match. But even with the losing season at the end, winning six national titles at a time where you had to win four games or sometimes five in the national tournament is amazing. And it shows in his playoff record as he has a 35 and eight record in NAIA playoff play. But he is just slightly behind my coach at number two, which is Ken Sparks. This was one coach that was brought up a few times when I asked about best NAIA coaches, and it's really no shock since he coached for 46 seasons and has the winning and titles to back it up. Sparks would start playing football in the mid-1960s at Carson Newman College, and after college he would be an assistant at the high school level around the Knoxville and Morristown, Tennessee area for about a decade. Following that, he would get his first head coaching job at the high school level, where he would have nothing but winning in the three seasons he coached as he went 29 and 5. And then he would be brought back to his alma mater in 1980 to be the head coach. This was less than a decade after he was playing on the team. And when Sparks got there, all he did was win. As from 1980 to 2010, he won seven games or more, 28 out of 30 of them. He would also bring titles to the school as he brought his first NAIA title in 1983. And then he would follow it up with another national title game appearance. But Carson Newman would tie the game, so they would co-win the national title in 1984, which is kind of weird, but they didn't have overtime, so yes, there are co-champions in a couple of NAIA national title games. But Sparks would continue to get his alma mater to the top of the mountain as they went to the NAIA national title game from 1986 to 1989 and won three out of four of those years. He would follow that first decade up with another winning decade as Carson Newman won their conference, the South Atlantic Conference, nine out of the 10 years in the 90s. He would also make it to the national title game in 1996, 1998, and 99, but fell short in all three. And with the new millennium, Sparks would have trouble getting to the top of the mountain again, and his team would only win the conference six out of ten years, and didn't make it to the national title game or game appearances, which I guess is a negative, but still, he won six conference titles out of ten. His record would start to falter a bit in the 2010s, as Carson Newman had their first losing season under him in 2011, and the team would never win the conference and only get to the quarterfinals of the NAIA tournament. Sparks would retire after the 2016 season, where his team would only suffer their second losing season in the last 40 plus years, and unfortunately Ken Sparks would pass away in 2017 after a long battle with prostate cancer. Sparks was and still is named one of the best coaches in any division in college football, and it's hard to argue as he won 338 games, placing him sixth in coaching wins in all divisions of college football. He also won five national titles, more than any other coach on this list, except for the number one coach. He also won 21 South Atlantic Conference titles, even though he won all of his national titles in the first decade of coaching. That still shouldn't disregard the fact that he was a consistent winner, only having two losing records, plus this guy was battling cancer for the last couple of years of coaching. And coming in at number one is a Texas coach and Texas native who gains a lot of good acclaim from his time in college and a lot of bad acclaim from his time professionally coaching which I'll shortly go over. But anyway, this Texas native at number one is Gil Steinke. He played at Texas A&I and then fought in World War II before a short stint on the Philadelphia Eagles. After his playing career, he quickly moved into coaching as he was an assistant in Oklahoma at A&M and then Texas A&M until 1953. After that, he would gain the job as head football coach at his alma mater, Texas A&I. 
which is now known as Texas A&M Kingsville. His start at A&I was a little rough, as from 1954 to 58, his team could not win their conference, the Lone Star Conference, but they did have four winning seasons. Their breakthrough would eventually happen, though, in 1959, as the team went 9-1 and and won their conference. They then went to the Western Playoff of the NAIA and shut out Hillsdale College, a team that hadn't been shut out in over three years, and they would make it to the NAIA title game. In that title game, they would again beat another undefeated team, this time in Lenore Ryan, to win their first national title game. And this national title game would lead them into the 1960s, where Texas A&I would hit their stride and have winning records throughout the decade, including undefeated seasons in 1962 and 67. Since the NAIA tournament was only four or eight teams, It was, again, really tough for all undefeated teams to make their chase for the title. But once Texas A&I and Steinke were able to break through, they were the team that you had to beat to even have a chance at that NAIA title. Starting in 1969, the team and Steinke would win five more national titles, yes, five, over the next eight years, and they would be unbeatable. As in the mid-1970s, from 1974 to 1976, this team went 38-0, winning three straight NAIA national titles. And he would retire after that final undefeated season to be the athletic director until 1982. Over the 23 years at Texas A&I, he went 182, 62, and 4. He won 10 conference titles and 6 national titles. This guy probably would have won 200 games easily if he would have coached until the 1980s season because he really only needed like 3 more seasons at 10 wins to get over that point. But I have mentioned Steinke and Texas A&I before because he would lead this team to the first American football games in Europe after the 1976 season and if you haven't seen that video i will put a link above right now or in the description below so you can check that out after this video but one of his biggest things was that he would integrate his football team as he recruited the first african-american player to a college football team in all of texas and this was a few years before several other division one texas colleges did so But stories have come out about this guy losing his senility late in life, and this was mostly seen in his very short pro coaching career as he coached in the USFL for two seasons, and stories have come out about him not even coaching and not even knowing what day of the week it was. People would just bring him onto the field and his assistants would have to do all the work. But negating that very short pro coaching career, this guy is a Texas legend, and that is why he is number one on my list of best NAIA college coaches. And thank you so much for hanging out with me on this list of the top 10, well, really top 11, I guess, because we had two guys tied for 10. NAIA college football coaches. If you liked it, make sure you give it a like below. Also, please share it with an NAIA football fan or an NAIA former player, maybe someone you know who is a fan of a small NAIA school because I want to see what they think. Also, please tell me what other coaches I'm missing. I'm sure I'm missing someone. It was very hard to do this list because there are a lot of really great NAIA coaches. Some guys like who I haven't even mentioned who won 200 games who I couldn't even put on this list. So again, mention them in the comments below. Please be nice about it. Uh, Also, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel below. Ring the bell so you can get updates on brand new videos. And as always, if you haven't already, please check out my podcast and help out the channel on my Patreon. Links in the description below. 